Excellent. All right. It looks like we're we're good to go. All right. So I'm going to be uh, be presenting the the first part of the the slides here, and then we'll do a little little tag team with with Stephen here. And if I get anything wrong, Stephen, feel free to to jump in and correct me. So we're going to start off today with a uh, with an icebreaker, and we're going to do it in the in the chat. And your icebreaker question for today, which you can see on the screen, is if you could go back in time and pay more attention to any class in high school, what would you choose? If there's something in high school that you wish you had paid a little more attention to. With the screen sharing view, I oh wait, no, I can't see them. Let's pull this up here. Ah, uh, mechanics three. Spelling, yeah, that's the one for me. Quite a variety. Excellent. Well, all you guys continue chatting there in the, the chat box. We'll get into the presentation. All right, so this is the, the, the third session and we're gonna be shifting from talking about, uh, oh, looks like we got a little, little bit of a formatting thing going on here. Must not, must not like my computer. It looks, looks fine on Steven. So we're gonna be shifting from vulnerabilities to sort of what do you do about it? Um, a reminder that the lectures uh, are recorded, so what you say in the chat will be saved for posterity and used against you if possible. No, we won't. We won't be using it again. So today's uh, agenda, we're going to be talking about uh, step three. We'll I'll give a short introduction, and then um, Stephen is going to go into some some details on the assignment and the, the homework on the mechanics of it. So today we're we're jumping from the step of assessing what we did uh, last week, assessing climate change vulnerabilities, to evaluating what do we do about those, evaluating our objectives and sort of looking at those impacts and how they interact with our objectives. Can we still do our objectives? Do they make them harder to do? Do they make them easier to do? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And that's part of the reason that we sort of gave you a heads up last week to not jump to this step. Part of the part of the idea of this whole work workbook is to keep things from being overwhelming uh, to you. So we try to separate these two steps. So step three is really about describing how climate change can affect your objectives. Um, um, and this is really where we start to make things climate smart, to take what you're working on and modify it given the vulnerabilities that you sort of uncovered in the in the last step. It's similar to looking at, at vulnerabilities, but it's a little bit different because we're looking at your plans, at your objectives and what you're trying to do. Um, and again, one way that sort of helps to not be quite as overwhelming is that we're not trying to solve climate change. When you start looking at those vulnerabilities, you're like, what do I do about climate change you know, overall? And that can be very overwhelming. And in this, this step, we're really trying to focus it in just on your project and what you're trying to do and how climate change affects those steps. So it's similar, but it's a it's similar to what we were doing last time, but it's a little bit different. So some of the key questions that we want to, to address when we're going through these steps are what management challenges or opportunities might occur. And so often we'll we'll jump to those management challenges. How does this make it more difficult? But it's also good to keep in mind that some of these things could be opportunities. Um, and then another question that we don't often ask unless we're prompted for it is, can the current management even meet those goals? So this is a step where we have, we intentionally sort of take a step back and say, can we even meet those goals with the you know, with the resources that we have available, or are we going to need to either come up with new goals or, you know, make a pitch to, to leadership or funders or something 
to increase the resources that we're going to need to put towards something. Um, so there's sort of a, a chance to see, do the goals need to change? Um, and that might be a small change to the goals. It might be a big change to the goals. Um, but this is sort of the, the step where you start asking those questions. Another aspect and another thing that often is a, a challenge for, um, for this step is that we need to focus on things that are, are within our control. Um, so often people will sort of get into this step and be like, oh, what we need to do is X, Y, and Z. And when you start digging a little bit deeper, you're like, but do you have the, you know, is there policy in place that would support that? Is that something that's legal? Is that something that you can do with the resources that you have within your decision space as a, as a manager? Or is this someplace where you're gonna start needing to document down that you're gonna to need to, you know, get a change in policy, that you're going to need to get, you know, a change in budget, a change in um, staffing, something along those lines that will make it possible for you to, to either meet those goals or change the goals. So here's some ex examples of some challenges from, from climate change. So we've got our, our objectives here. We're looking at um, you know, an objective around habitat for eastern box turtles, another one for forest interior birds, and another one for walking trails. And then from climate change, we can see that you know, making habitat for eastern box turtles is going to be more difficult for a variety of reasons. There are going to be declines that could be affecting certain interior birds, and extreme precipitation is going to make these walking trails more difficult to, to maintain, um, especially with erosion and hazard trees. So things that make it, sometimes things will make it easier. They won't necessarily be harder. So there are new opportunities that are also um, available with, with climate change. And again, you wanna focus on those things that are, are within, your, with, within your, your level of control. So we also, you know, sort of write down looking at the impacts from climate change, what are some opportunities for each of the, these objectives as well. So it might be harder to maintain habitats because of winter snowpack, but increased precipitation can offset some of those concerns about drier conditions for the turtle. Again, you may have projected declines in conifer species for forest interior birds, but some of these birds aren't relying necessarily on the conifer mix, more on the, you know, the structure of the forest. Um, and then, so, you know, and then it gets down to which forest interior birds are you, are you talking about? Or is your objective really about forest interior birds in general? And again, with the walking trails, there's, um, might be a longer uh, season of use for those trails again, and that may be an opportunity from a, a, the point of access. And then once you have your conservation challenges from climate change, challenges that climate change is going to be affecting in your area to your specific objective, you've got challenges and opportunities, you start to weigh those out and sort of compare them and see how they, how they stack up. And this is where you start asking those questions about feasibility, because you've got additional challenges, you've got additional opportunities. How does that you know, sort of all shake out over time? And we're not asking you to give a, you know, a specific answer where you have to say exactly what's going to happen. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty how climate change will play out, how lots of other things will play out in the future. We're really just asking for almost like a gut, gut check. I think there's going to be high feasibility for this. You know, the opportunities are greater than the challenges. I think we'll be able to do this. Moderate, you're somewhere in the middle, you're not really sure. So they seem to seem to be balancing maybe or low where it's like, you know, these challenges are, are really big and the opportunities don't look like they're gonna offset it. So we're really just looking for you to bin it into three different areas and not give sort of a, a specific prediction for the future. So for these ones, you could say, you know, for, for box turtle, you've got balancing going on, it looks moderate. For these forest interior birds, it looks like the opportunity is, is high. The, the opportunities offset the, the challenges. But for the walking trails, you know, this, this increased erosion is probably going to offset the, the drying out earlier in the season. And the drying out earlier in the season and more use may, 
may actually make the erosion problem worse. So then feasibility would be would be low for that. One. So again, we often have this assumption that we're going to be going along with these objectives. We, as humans, we tend to anchor on those things that we know. And we want you to be you know, explicit here and really prompt you to say, are we going to be going on with these objectives into the future? Or do we need to you know, abandon some objectives or, or really uh, change around the objectives and goals? Especially for something where the, the feasibility is low, like this maintaining existing and developing new walking trails. So in that case, you're not so much evaluating as you're reevaluating those goals. And it sort of gives you sort of a, a shortcut where you start start back into the, the cycle again and define, um, define a new objective. Um, now that you know what you know about climate change and its impacts on certain aspects and areas, you may need to go back and redefine those, those goals and objectives. And so the workbook, you know, it'll prompt you for this and then it'll auto update those things, um, sort of taking it back to back to step three. So again, when you're when you're doing your, your evaluation, it's not only, you know, climate change isn't the only thing that's happening. I think as as you know, land managers, we know climate change is unfortunate. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's not the only thing that we need to worry about. And this is also where we start to incorporate those other considerations. You know, if you're looking at something where there's going to be more need for um, funding for non-game wildlife, and you're expecting, you know, Wawa funding to come through or expecting a large grant to come through, then maybe that's another consideration that you incorporate here. Maybe something that's going to take more resources is realistic in the future. Um, at the same time, you know, if you're looking at uh, something where you've got declining budgets, declining, you know, structural uh, restrictions on, on staffing or capacity, that's something to incorporate here, here as well. So there may be social factors, financial factors, other factors that either increase or decrease your opportunities and your, your flexibility. So you can incorporate those into the workbook as well. Um, so you've got for, for the box turtle one, high uncertainty. You don't really know how the habitats are going to be affected. So if the turtle's present, you, you're going to want to maintain those habitats as long as possible. Um, and again, on this, this last one, if with the resources that you've got, with all the additional erosion, you're not going to be able to meet this, this goal on trails. But if there were additional funding, you could make the improvements to the, you know, the engineering and the, the erosion uh, sensitivity of those trails. All right, I think this is where I kick it over to Stephen to talk about the specifics of the workbook. And you're still muted, Stephen. Yeah. I can do the slides from here if you want me to. Yep, and I think there's some more for you um, after this slide, but just, just so folks know what the what the working screen of the workbook looks like here in step three. Again, you will be, um, you'll have kind of a, an organizational panel in the middle there, that evaluate objectives panel that'll show different tracks for all of the management topics that you have created. So that'll be, you know, you'll see the red hazard triangles all through that, that middle white column when you start this step. And that just lets you know you have objectives here that have not yet been rated for feasibility. And so that will steer you through each of your goals and objectives. For each objective, it will prompt you to either add challenges or add opportunities. And like Chris said, that this is your chance to do your mental balance sheet and think about in general, is climate change making this objective easier or harder to accomplish. This is where you start to really establish your rationale for carrying forward with business as usual or carrying forward with the objective that you started with. Or like Chris mentioned, if you might need to revise, abandon, uh, or 
you know, just re reevaluate any of the objectives that you started with. This is where that, that rationale really comes through. So add challenges, opportunities, as many as you need to, to uh, reflect the challenges and opportunities. And then there's that um, drop down menu there for feasibility where we're just asking you for a low, medium, high rating and some rationale next to it in case you want to sum up, okay, I had this mix of challenges and opportunities. This is ultimately why I ended up at high versus low. Um, there's a, a chance there for you to put the headline in. Chris, I think that's all I'll say on this slide. Okay. Yep, so um, some key points to, to remember on this one, the challenges and opportunities that we're talking about here, and as a land manager, you know a lot of different challenges and opportunities, but this workbook is really for you to systematically step through the climate change related ones. So the challenges and opportunities should relate to climate because the other considerations section is something where you can talk about the things that aren't related to climate. That sort of helps separate these, these things out. Think of one sort of way to think about this as you're going through it is imagine that the audience is either the person who has your job next, you know, and they're looking at this five, 10, 15 years down the road going, what were they thinking when they did this climate change project? What, what, why did they do it this way? And this should give them some sense of that. Another potential audience would be say your boss. Your boss might be you know, asking, so five years ago, why did, why did you choose to you know, put all of these you know, erosion control things in, on, on the trail? And you can say, well, this is what we expected given the data that we had five years ago. You can go back to this workbook and, and figure it out. So this is really a way to, um, one of the benefits of using a workbook and a structured approach like this is to be able to show your work um, and create sort of institutional memory for you know, things like climate change, which happen, they happen in events, but they also happen over a very long period of time. So some of this is going to feel redundant and we've gotten feedback. We've done this enough time. We know we get feedback on this. It, it feels a little redundant and that is on purpose um, because we want to systematically sort of break apart the climate impacts for the site and then how you deal with them in, a, in the objectives. And so you're gonna be thinking about the same sort of things that you were thinking about in the, same, in the, the previous step, but taking them a step further and really evaluating how they relate to your objectives. Now, again, because this is a, a systematic approach, a systematic workbook, you're going to feel like when, when you've done this step, you're gonna feel like you wanna jump right to what the solutions are. That's natural, that's human, that's what we wanna do. But part of the reason we're doing this systematically is to separate those things out. So you have time to think about each of the steps intentionally and really go over each of the objectives with this this aspect of it. So really looking at the vulnerability of your objectives to the climate change stuff that you talked about last week. And then in the future, the next step, we'll be talking about what do we do about it? And we have some tools that'll help you hopefully feel a little less overwhelmed when we're talking about that, that step. All right, so this is a example from Saw Lake Bog Nature Preserve. Is this, these are still my slides, Stephen? Can I, okay, yep. And this is a, uh, a bog, not actually not very far from, from where I grew up near Grand Rapids. It's a bog that's further south than most of the bogs um, in Michigan. So it's one that we would expect to be impacted by, by climate change earlier than other things. And this is a, taken from a, a previous project that was done by the West Michigan Land Conservancy or Land Conservancy of West Michigan. So their goal, and this is sort of sort of walking you through through an example. Their their management goal was to maintain high quality wetland communities and restore a diverse mix of prairie, savanna, and forest resembling Michigan's historical landscape matrix. That was the goal for the area. They have a, a really neat high diversity bog there. And then next to it was a former agricultural field that they're doing a prairie restoration. So they want to maintain this this fog and hardwood 
with a um, FQI, which is really looking at the, the quality of the, the flora that's there, how, how sensitive it is it, how diverse is it. Um, they wanted to maintain that at a very high level and then keep the exotic species at a, at a very low level and then expand the prairie slowly over time. Climate change impacts where you can have changing precipitation patterns and bogs are affected by uh, dry summer conditions. You have more heavy rain events. And so you're gonna have interaction with um, surrounding uh, farms, especially as nutrient sources. Bogs are a very low nutrient system. And so having more nutrients come in would increase the, the opportunity for invasive species for non-native species. And then you could potentially have shifting plant distributions as well. Um, and that could interact with your the relatively low diversity of plants in the, the prairie area, that's a, a restoration area. And then it's going to be exacerbated by invasive uh, species and insect pests that are going to be, you know, coming in because they can move faster uh, across the landscape in the changing climate. So some challenges that uh, they were anticipating, summer drying could affect frog species like sphagnum. Um, it could increase runoff could affect the acidity or the nutrients coming into the bog. Changing precipitation could limit prescribed burn windows for the prairie. And increased droughty conditions could facilitate expansion of spotted knapweed, which is one of those uh, non-native species that they wanted to keep below 1%. There were some opportunities, however. Um, there's the possibility that southern bog species could expand into the area, which could offset losses in their floristic quality index, or uh, maybe even increase it. There's going to be a mix of northern and southern species for a while. Hotter and drier summers could benefit the native prairie species and the prairie community as a whole. Prairies in Michigan are sort of on the, the wet, cool end of their, their distribution. And so hotter, drier summers could put them more towards the, the middle of their climate niche. And so overall, they saw this as a medium feasibility. There are some challenges, there are some opportunities. And then the, the next step sort of give you a, a preview of, of the, the next step looking forward. Then they're sort of looking at these heavy rain events. What can they do about them? What are some uh, adaptation approaches and tactics? One would be to acquire adjacent lands to ensure appropriate buffers and reduce runoff. Another thing might be maintaining and expanding forested buffers around the specific kettle pond to, to maintain their, their quality. Uh, with drier summers, they could enhance wet, uh, the wet swale to sort of low depressions in the landscape. They could make those a little bit deeper with shallow excavation to capture some of the, uh, the groundwater, which would encourage uh, music or wetland species or give them an area within this small landscape where they could establish and move to from the, the drier, the, the areas that would be drying out. And then invasive species, they felt that they're going to have to increase their, their capacity, which they could do through more volunteer participation in monitoring and control and so on. So that gives you some sense of sort of a preview of the next step, the things that they can do. Again, we're not asking you to do that this week. Um, this week, we're just really trying to focus in on those impacts to the goals and objectives. And next week, we'll look at what we can do about it. And then going all the way to, to step five, uh, we've got the, the bog, uh, the monitoring and evaluating the effectiveness of, the, of this work. So one of, one of the metrics that they want to monitor for the future is the water level in the bog. Is it changing? Is it drying? Um, also looking at water quality of the, the bog and some of these, these kettle wetlands. Um, and then looking at plant diversity and composition. So they're gonna to have to continually monitor these things that are their, are their goals to see if there's a need for, for more um, intervention. And then also monitoring the percentage of invasive species. All right, that takes us to our question period. I will watch the chat 
in case folks are more comfortable entering questions in that way, but please don't be, don't be shy, speak up and uh, let Chris hear what, what uh, questions you have about feasibility. Well, Chris, I think you stumped them or you explained it perfectly. <laughs> there um, we go. I guess I guess I have a question. I don't know if it's really a question, but just, I don't know. I hate silence. It's awkward. So, um, so I guess I'm kind of taking this class more as like, like a, like a theory kind of thing. Um, you know, I, um, I study these birds, but I don't actually make any management decisions. Like as a, as a lab, like we can give some um, recommendations. So there's that. Um, and um, so I'm not actually making management plans. Um, and also like, you know, looking at um, the projected effects of climate change on the landscape that I'm looking at, which is um, forested peatlands in like northern Minnesota, like it doesn't look great, right? Like in like 30 years, they're not going to be a thing anyways. Um, but that, does, but like the solutions and like management plans that we come up with can be used right for like more northern bogs in the future to help, you know, maintain that kind of um, habitat. So I mean, like, so, you know, when ultimately I come to my objectives and stuff and the, and the feasibility for my management site is low, like, is that a reason to abandon going forward with like the rest of like my plans for this workshop? You know what I'm saying? Right, I, I think there's, so there's, there's two pieces Two pieces to that, that that I'm hearing, and I'll I'll chime in and I'll let Stephen jump jump in as well. Um, so I think climate change. So let me back up a little bit. I, my my training is as a, a landscape ecologist, and so when I look at climate change, I think of you know these sort of large patterns of you know shifting species distributions and redistribution of, of communities um, that we're likely to see with climate change, and so I think of something moving north as sort of that's naturally what's going to happen um when i talk to managers they're often they they need guidance for the place itself and so i would probably focus in on you know if you're talking about a forested peatland for example and um thinking this is this is probably going to be pretty low feasibility um try to think creatively about what would be appropriate or what would be most responsible for someone who's like stuck in that place to do with that? What what would be the next goal? Should it be an unforested peatland? Should it be, um, should they be um, tolerating more invasive species because they might be filling niches that are left open by species that can't persist in that area? Or should they be doing assisted migration of, you know, key species. So there's some, some controversial and thorny questions that you start to ask, especially for these low feasibility projects, what, what do we do next? So I would, I would put yourself in that thought rather than the, let's apply this same plan, but just apply it further north. Um, because those folks are gonna be dealing with the loss of something else and the opportunity for something to come in to their area as well. Chris, I think that was that was really good and, and good thoughts to consider. The other the other thing I would stress is that um, step three and these these feasibility ratings that we're asking you to do now, that is specifically feasibility under current management. So current practices, current 
timing, level of intensity, level of investment, et cetera. And so in many ways, like I said, this, this is kind of, um, this is you building the rationale for do your current objectives under current management hold up under climate change? And so if feasibility is low, that's not the end of the road because either your objective could change or your management could change, but you need to, we, we slow you down and we make you document that rationale so that you have a clear justification for going, going forward in, in either direction. Um, let's see, Sharon, I have a, a question from you in the chat. Um, Sharon would like to pick our brains about how to categorize climate change impacts to oak hickory forest undergoing mesification. Uh, Chris, this is, this is maybe in your bailiwick here. Are you reading the chat? Yep. Yes, yeah, so this is this is definitely definitely in my bailiwick. This is uh, something I just did my my dissertation on. So I could talk to you for an hour about this, and if you wanna if you wanna set up a time, we can we can really go take a deep dive into this. But yes, in general, those those systems um, when you talk to folks, oak hickory systems that are at the northern edge of their distribution. If you start moving climate change or moving the climate niche. They end up more in the middle, and so you would expect them to be doing, to have low, um, to have high, or low vulnerability, um, and high feasibility. However, when you um, start incorporating the the mesification and the challenges these systems are already facing, that does become uh, part of the challenge. The other, I think, one of the things to think carefully about is the feasibility for prescribed burns and how that interacts with climate change. I think in some geographies, you know, that might be something where you're going to have more opportunities. And in some geographies, that will be something where you'll have less opportunities. It'll either be too dry or too wet. Sharon, any follow up there? Um, yeah, that was that was definitely part of my my question. Um, I think with you know mesification over forests, we need to kind of do some thinning and stuff before we can even get the prescribed burns in. And then yes, we have, so we have a limited window in addition to that. Um, but in in general, like I was wrestling last week with like is you know I would love for the oak hickory forest to be you know moderately high adaptive capacity and low vulnerability, but given we have don't have these disturbances like do i categorize it as as moderate or is it lower than moderate in terms of adaptive capacity or higher than moderate in terms of vulnerability yeah i, I think it really comes back to uh, what what stephen was saying given what's currently going on or current capacity so if your current capacity to do the thinning and burning is low then you know then it's and correct me if I'm wrong here, Stephen, but then it would it would be a, a low feasibility. Uh. Yeah, again, that's that's maybe demonstrating that ah, we have this potential opportunity in the horizon, but in order to capitalize on it, we're going to have to do A, B, and C. Um, so I think that's a, a fair rationale. Yeah, the thing that I often tell people about oak hickory is that. With the climate, you know, it, with just a pure niche model, it looks like it's a winner in southern Michigan or even throughout Michigan. It looks like it's, it's the thing to go for. But if we look at what's happening in Missouri, which is the climate that Michigan is supposed to have, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, they have mesification going on too. They're not getting health, healthy regeneration of oak hickory forests unless they develop this, you know, address mesification. Yeah, Peggy. So um, carrying this idea forward about, you know, current conditions and 
everything. Um, I'm assuming that would apply to policy well, as well. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, um, you know, Apostle Islands is 80% wilderness, but I um, know that some people are starting to think about wilderness in different ways in light of climate change. And so can someone address that idea? Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your recent history has been low intervention or no intervention, then I think that's what you should use to rate the feasibility in this, in this feasibility step of your objectives. I would ask you not to keep that off the table when we get to step four and you start brainstorming how to adapt. You know, you know the, the winds are shifting a little bit there. So, so please do consider that when we get to adaptation. But for now, feasibility, I understand. Again, it's part of building the rationale. Here's, here's our current situation and here's why our current situation may or may not be robust to future climates. Okay, thanks. Okay, Chris, do you wanna take us to the next uh, slide or two? Yep. Okay, just a, a quick recap. Uh, again, we went through this, but I'm happy to, um, to spend more time on this if folks need to back up and, and go through the, the step, but the, the functionality of actually going through this step of the adaptation workbook is simpler than step two. Um, and it, again, it's just hitting that add challenge, add opportunity button as many times as you need for those objectives and, and adding the, um, adding the notes, adding the justification that'll help you remember, okay, yeah, here's why, or here's how I would explain this to my coworker or to my supervisor or to the public. Um, and then doing that high, medium, low rating of feasibility. Um, like Chris said, this is an opportunity to revise or revisit objectives in step one. And so if you go back to step one and edit, it'll carry those through uh, forward. Um, next slide. So just a reminder of where we are in the course here. So we have, so we did, Third lecture today, um, we have discussion tomorrow and Wednesday. So st stay, plan to stay in your same discussion groups uh, that you were in for our first discussion. And you'll meet with Steve, myself, Marta, Chris, Patricia on your assigned time. That'll be an opportunity to review what you did for step two and also to ask more questions and to prompt you all a little bit on step three. So we realize we're, you know, we're having this discussion just now after you're getting these instructions, we don't expect you to have step three completed by your discussion session. It's a chance to think about it and come to us with, with more detailed questions. And we'll do some activities to gauge your, your initial thoughts on feasibility. Um, also, this is a time to this week or next week, Schedule a check-in with your primary instructor who you got teamed up with before the course, who was helping you think about your step one goals and objectives. This is just an opportunity to, to see if you're having any hangups, how the course is progressing, anything we can help you with, whether it's hunting down resources or, or answering specific questions. Um, next week is our break week. Um, so the week of the 21st, we have no scheduled lecture or discussion sessions. So use that as a catch up if you need to, or work ahead if you need to, if you know you have a later spring break or Easter vacation or whatever it is, just plan, um, 
plan on that week next week and, and use it wisely however you need to. And next slide, Chris. Um, this is not coming up this week or next week. So thinking way ahead now to March 29th, just letting you all know that we will be having a deeper dive on climate adaptation and wildlife. Um, we'll mention this again beforehand, but just because there's a, a couple of weeks off between now and the week of the 28th, I wanted to be sure you all are aware of this and have it on your calendars. So this is a chance to get a much deeper um, explanation of what climate adaptation might look like for wildlife. Okay, and is there anything else, Chris? Any other slides? Okay, so maybe take us back to that questions placeholder. So before the class today, um, Patricia went through all of your step two homework. Um, see, I promised we would be checking on your homework. And thank you, Patricia, for doing that. Um, and she rounded up a couple of the key questions that, um, that came up from some of you. And so I wanted to run through those quickly and see if any folks have any, um, any other questions or if you wanna riff on, on any of those, maybe some folks are, are just struggling with the same thing. Um, so extended Q and A. Um, one person asked a really good question about kind of flip-flopping or, or seeing both sides between wanting to have a project organized around a species versus a project organized around the habitat management. And kind of wondering, oh, well, should I, should I have done more species stuff in here if my goals are all habitat? And then maybe feeling like something was missing. Um, and so I would say, why not both? Um, and, and we would love it if you, if you have time or if you have the inclination, if you feel like you're too much habitat and you're realizing now, oh, well, actually, there's a, there's a couple species here that are really driving my decisions. And I wish I had an opportunity to think about, okay, what, what are the effects of climate change on that species life history or reproduction or distribution? If you feel like you're missing any of that please feel free, go, go back and put in, even if it's just one goal and one objective about that species, that'll give you a track in your workbook to then go through and put those ideas in because that'll springboard you into some new adaptation ideas above and beyond just habitat management. Um, so I, I, by all means, I would, I would encourage you to do that even if it's a really streamlined version of a species related objective. So thank you. I, I won't uh, call out who asked these questions, but a couple of folks had a question like that. Um, uh, somebody else noted that this vulnerability determination step, number one, feels really complicated. Um, and number two, that we're asking you to, to make a pretty subjective determination uh, about something that could be much more analytical. Um, and I'm sure several folks on this call could speak to this. Um, Peggy, you have been in the guts of a vulnerability assessment process. Patricia, Chris, um, many of you, I'm sure. Um, and there's always this point at which uh, analytics has to seed ground to expertise and, and kind of interpretation at a local level. Um, and and you know, Peggy and I wrestled with this for a vulnerability assessment for the Apostle Islands Lakeshore. So just that individual archipelago. Um, and even there, right, there's this, there's this moment where you can drill down spatially, but then you, you kind of have to take a step back and say, okay, based on these facts that I have, and even if they may be mismatched to my region and I'm having to do kind of mental downscaling to think about how these regional trends might play out in my area, then I'll have to go a step further and think about how do these things interact through time? 
you know, I guess my point is, it's always going to be subjective. And so you may feel a little silly, or you may feel like you're walking out on a limb by um, kind of putting your mark down and saying, yes, medium vulnerability, because X, Y, and Z. And there, so that's, that's fine, frankly. You're always going to have a little bit of that uncertainty and discomfort with that, because the science is never going to be perfectly settled. This is never going to be purely a plug and chug sort of exercise, regardless of the scale you're working with. Chris, you look like you want to say something. I would invite other folks to respond to this too. Yeah, I was, I was just going to jump in. I think that's, that's exactly right. There, there comes a point where this feels very objective, like you're, you're making a very subjective assessment about something that there should be a lot of science on. And the, the fact is there's not a lot of science on a lot of these things. And it's a very complex system um, when you're talking about ecosystems. Everything's connected to everything else. And so you get these things that happen that you didn't predict. That's, that's normal in managing ecosystems. It's even more so with when you start incorporating climate change. It's a whole nother level of risk and uncertainty that you're layering on top of this. Um, and that's, that's perfectly normal. Really, I think the way to think about it is, you know, are you giving your best guesses as, as, as you know, someone who's used the information that's in front of you? And that's really all that we're asking for. And I think that's all anybody can expect at this point. I know I did a vulnerability assessment back in 2013. I look back at that and there are three or four species where more science came out later and I was completely wrong. So I give you guys permission to be completely wrong as well. Just give it your best guess with what you've, what you've got and that, that's really all we're looking for and all anyone can expect. Marta or Patricia, anything you would add to that? Caitlin says we're being too wishy-washy. I would say- well, I was agreeing with Michael's comment that like oh. I do the same way. You guys are not being wishy-washy. <laughs> I think Chris summed it up really well. And I think, you know, we're really inclined as scientists to say like, we wanna develop this. So like Chris, my background is also in thinking about species distributions and, and landscape level approaches. And it's really, you know, tempting to uh, want to kind of come out with like a map of this is where suitable areas are going to be at these exact time slices in the future. And that may tell part of the story, but these are really complex systems. So I think a lot of the time, this more uh, descriptive approach uh, can potentially kind of cover cover the bases and cover those uncertainties um, better than you know coming out with a like <laughs> this is exactly where this is going to be, especially when we're thinking about climate change and we're thinking about different future scenarios that we really can't assign likelihoods to because there's a whole you know, suite of interactions and human decisions that are going into those. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a frustrating process, but I think in the end, it creates a, a, a product that we can be more comfortable about going into the future than trying to kind of assign a precision to, to everything we're doing. Marta, you hit, you hit on, I feel like we're given a, a $10 answer for a $1 question. So sorry if we're just like, we get it already. Um, but Marta, you hit on a, a really good word and that is descriptive. And so I will, I will, I will um, re-emphasize that, that you all have the opportunity here to show your work and kind of build your, put your rationale in this workbook. You know, this, and this will be your opportunity to look back eight years later, like Chris got to do and say, boy, I was wrong about A, B, and C, um, or, oh, this played out in the way I thought. So you get to, don't just, don't just make a decision that you feel wishy-washy about and don't provide any of the details. Be sure to put in, okay, this is, this is why. Um, okay, uh, one 
last question. It was kind of a combo question, but somebody was thinking about, you know, outside of wildlife management uh, exclusively, they're working in a, you know, a state wildlife management area or state habitat area that is also expected to have increased tourism under future scenarios. And so like the, the human interaction with this place will be changing alongside the climate pressures that the wildlife are facing. And, um, and I think the question was, do I also consider that a climate impact? Um, and I, I think that you can, especially when, you know, especially when you're not making like too many leaps in logic. Um, but like if, for example, if, if trends are already up or if it's a clear like um, relationship to something going on in the climate and what people are expecting for recreation or the timing of recreation, then yeah, that, that can be part of your rationale and that's not too much of a stretch going outside of current management. You know, you, you don't have to start thinking about how to adapt to changing visitor use seasons or, or you know, increasing crowds. You'll do that in step four. But if you want to document, I think visitation patterns may change or I think we may see more public use, then, then yeah, you can put that in as a, as a climate challenge or opportunity. Uh, Peggy? Yeah, the Park Service, and I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, has done um, some work specifically related to this question. And, um, and there's several parks that they, you know, examined and uh, Apostles was one of them. In light of the potential of increasing visitation specifically due to, you know, a climate um, parameter changing. And the one I think that they focused on quite a bit is um, temperature. And uh, so, yeah, it was a, a really good uh, research article, and I can share it if anybody is interested in it. I think the only caveat I would put on that is that if you're thinking that the human use is going to be changing for reasons completely unrelated to climate, that probably would go in other considerations. But in this case, when we're talking about parks, especially if you're in the northern part of the, the country, we're gonna have more days where people can recreate during the year. So we would expect climate to be driving more people into, into these areas. If you're working in say, Southwestern United States, that could be different. You could actually be looking at a shrinking number of people visiting. And the, I mentioned that was a two-part question. The, the other part of this question had to do with um, public scrutiny basically. And like this, this person's project is touching on a number of hot button issues that are likely to, you know, raise, raise passions. Um, and so I think that, I don't know exactly how to build that into the workbook, but it, it seems like definitely worthwhile to bring that in as another consideration and also something to be mindful of that this person already was thinking about this, but when I propose different adaptation actions, there's gonna be strong feelings, whatever I do. And so um, just be mindful of when, when you propose an action, adaptation action further on down the line in the course here, you know, wh what segments of your, of your public is that going to affect? Um, and how would, how would you, steps one through three of this workbook are, how would you explain that you might need to do this? controversial thing. You're, you're building the case for that right now. Um, these are awesome questions, by the way, and, and I love this. You guys are, are really sinking your teeth in. Um, Patricia, thank you for, for um, cobbling these together really quickly. That, and so that's where my, um, my Q&A period ends. Did that shake loose anything else from, from anyone? I'll just make one, one additional comment on that and because I'm developing a, a, delivering a talk on climate communication tomorrow to an, another audience. Um, 
often if you're especially if it's something that could be controversial and it's tied to climate change you're you're going to probably have to bring your affected public your stakeholders along on steps two and three and four before you start you know you drop the the, the big changes on them um, because if you bring big changes people are going to go back and you know self-justify and come up with reasons and it, it will just trust me it will make it a, a bigger mess if you don't bring everyone along with this thinking and that's one of the benefits of a workbook like this is that you've sort of shown your work, but you're going to have to share your work. Also, if you're changing your goals, you're going to have to go back to whatever goal making process uh, you have uh, with your stakeholders. Okay, one last opportunity for any hanging questions. All right, well, we'll look forward to seeing you all in discussion sessions this week. Thanks again. Thanks, Chris, for leading the presentation this week. My pleasure.